How do you transform a cavernous coal church into a futuristic house? Or turn dilapidated old barns into a stylish family home? From industrial wonders to ancient windmills, this series follows brave homeowners the original wall has come away from the chapel. As they take on the seemingly impossible challenges. That isn't going to happen until next year, never mind three weeks time. It's absolutely barreling down. Of transforming historic structures never built to be lived in. We explore the master craft and ingenious modern design it takes to build an impossible house. It's another bit of history saved. This time, we're in Australia, following a courageous family. The building itself is quite small. Some of the boards are rotten on the end, so there's a lot of replacement to be done. Dad's really good to work with. He's open to ideas. He will say no to a lot of things, but you can beat him down. You just keep pushing and pushing, and he'll eventually roll over. Taking on a mammoth move. It's eight metres wide at the bottom and eight and a half metres wide at the top part of it. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. With complex construction challenges. Very nice, very nice. And spiralling costs. What's that worth? About $10,000 sitting in, there. in, that, in those drums. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> to transform this century-old Salvation Army Hall into a spectacular family home. Oh, beer, Grant, what a surprise. Thank you very much. In Queensland, on Australia's east coast... Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> family man Bob Chambers is the proud owner of a steel fabrication business. He also has a passion for property and is about to take on his most ambitious renovation to date. I started developing small projects about three or four years ago, and this is my biggest one. The rest of them were done for my daughters. Bob has three grown-up children, and his daughter Lucy is helping him project manage his latest venture. Our family, we have this ability to live together, breathe together, work together. We've always done everything together. Bob's ambitious plan to restore an historic structure and turn it into a home has been a long-held dream. But it was put on hold several years ago when his wife, Robin, sadly became terminally ill. The idea actually transitioned into a reality um, after I lost uh, my wife uh, to cancer, unfortunately, three years ago. So I decided, well, I might as well see that project through because we never had an opportunity to do it together. We were together for uh, 38, 39 years. Um, Robin and I met when we were only teenagers and uh, she always had a design flair for something a bit different. So she was naturally gifted in that regard. Um, so therefore we were a good team from on the practical side and she's a, more on the design side. She would have been around, she would have helped me. And my daughter's helping me with some of the design concepts because she's very much like a mother. They come like from the very top, top of the thing. Yes, and then go all, all the way, way down, down, all and the way down. Are we talking like this much of a section? 800 okay. wide. Dad's really good to work with. He's open to ideas, he's, he's flexible. He will say no to a lot of things, but you can beat him down. You just keep pushing and pushing, and then he'll eventually roll over. I learned that from my mum. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, he's really good. We have a good dynamic. Oh, yeah, right. It's all the way, all the way through. Yeah, holy moly. Yeah. Bob has bought this historic hall for $46,000. It was built in 1912 in the town of Nanango in Queensland for the Salvation Army. Used as a meeting place for locals, it closed its doors in 1994 and was moved to this special storage yard in 2008 in the hope that one day it might be saved and renovated. The hall was built on stilts from 365 metres of pine wood donated by locals. It was big enough to seat a gathering of 200 people. And its layout has not changed for over 100 years. 
At the back, there's a two-metre square pastor's office. And although the building is considered derelict, it still has all its original features, which Bob wants to keep. But this is not going to be a conventional renovation. Bob's plan is much bigger. He intends to move the hall 160 kilometres across country to this plot in the exclusive suburb of Cooperoo in Brisbane. It's very well known and well considered in the real estate area in Brisbane. Bob's bought the land and hall for $1.65 million. Moving it will cost another $46,000, and that's before any building work has started, which Bob reckons is going to add another $2 million, taking the total project cost to just under $4 million. This is not a cheap venture. Transforming the small hall into a family home needs big vision. The hall will form the proud centerpiece of Bob's dream home. On the ground floor will be an open plan kitchen diner with a feature fish tank and also the lounge area. They'll fit double height doors and apex windows to take in those city views. Above will sit the master bedroom with ensuite. And on the roof, solar panels will generate clean energy. To the rear, there will be a new pavilion with a lobby area and bedroom. And at the front, another larger two-bedroom pavilion will also house a further living area and spa. The grounds will be landscaped with four separate courtyards and a pond in the back garden, all to complete the transformation from a rickety Salvation Army hall into an eco-friendly luxury home. The building itself is quite small. Some of the boards are rotten on the ends, so there's a lot of replacement to be done. That little hut part there is where the pastor apparently lived every time he came up, but you can't even swing a cat in there. That will be removed before it goes down to Brisbane. We don't have steps at the moment, so uh, this is my entry. And it's uh, in its original condition. Windows are still operating, they might be a little bit worn or wear, but uh, they're still working. The cathedral windows that you see here will be retained and there may be some feature glass put into those to make them stand out. Bob anticipates the build will take two years, but there's a huge amount to do before his dreams become reality. Where I'm roughly standing right now is, is the location of where the kitchen will be. This cutout actually is, funny enough, about the size of the fish tank that you'll see when you walk through the main entry. The other end will have the lounge room in it, where you see a stage right now. That's where the big six metre tall aluminium doors will be put with uh, various pieces of coloured glass and lead lights in them. And that will um, give you the view out to the city and Mount Kutha. Above the kitchen is going to be the loft bedroom, which will be the main bedroom. Bob also has the environment in mind. Brisbane is in Queensland, known as the Sunshine State, so an ideal part of the world for an eco-home. There'll be a 20 kilowatt solar system placed on the roof, battery system for self-sustainability, two water tanks. Everything I can do to make it that way is being done to make it very eco-friendly. The first job is to slice the old pastor's room off the main structure. The hall itself is far too large to be transported in one piece, so they must sever and lift the roof off. Matt Cronin is in charge of hauling this fragile structure from the yard to Bob's plot. It won't be easy. Well, we're just transferring our support beams under the building now so we can carry the building on the road, just so that it'll keep it all straight. They support the base of the structure on steel beams. 
tie the walls tightly together with steel cables. Then carefully separate the roof from the 110-year-old walls and hoist the two sections of the hall onto flatbed trucks. As the loads are oversized, they will travel overnight with police escorts to minimize disruption on the roads. It's a military operation. It's eight metres wide at the bottom and eight and a half metres wide at the top part of it. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there, actually. We're travelling almost 300 kilometres. It's 10 o'clock right now and we really need to be off the road by four o'clock. We're heading from a rural country town down to Brisbane. There's power lines, there's bridges, there's traffic islands, there's roadworks. We've got to go through a couple of country towns. They've got narrow roads. We've got a long way to go and we can't afford to have any problems. Manoeuvring this massive cargo over narrow bridges and through small towns is going to test Matt's team to the limit. Don't go any more to the road. We've got a good crew behind us. We've got the police and the pilots, but it still doesn't mean there's no pressure on. I mean, there'll be a few spots where we've probably only got, you know, 100, 150 mil, absolute tops. It takes 48 long hours for Matt to haul Bob's historic haul 160 kilometres to his plot. There, cranes carefully reassemble the two sections of the fragile building back together so Bob can begin the task of restoring and extending it into a luxury family home. The building itself isn't that large, so it's going to be the central focus, and then there'll be two other buildings built front and rear, which will connect through bridges, and it will be made into a very upmarket home. The existing structure is just over 100 square metres. But Bob intends to double the footprint by building two extensions, making it a palatial four-bed eco-home with solar panels on the roof and a luxury spa underneath. Over the next few months, Bob's team erects the outer frames of the new pavilions. Cut that brace through there and then cut that. But, but yeah, like you and Blaney might have to hold each side. Every time you come, it changes, doesn't it? It's all coming together now. Bob's recently broken his leg in a fall, but there's no stopping him coming to site to push the build along. The rear pavilion is just about completed now, and it's going to be a, a one-bedroom, self-contained villa, and then a front pavilion, which is also a two-bedroom, self-contained villa. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Bob's vision to save an historic structure by transforming it into a luxury modern home is coming together. Brisbane gets at least seven hours of sunshine a day all year round, which Bob intends to fully take advantage of to make the building eco-friendly. So we're going to have about 18 kilowatts worth of solar panels here, and we've got a 15 kilowatt lithium battery that'll get installed in the back of the, the garage uh, with a couple of car recharge points. Almost be totally off grid with that. Bob's installing solar panels to power everything inside and outside, including car charging. All of this will be wired up and managed by a smart app, ensuring every element of the house is only in use when it's needed. Bob is also burying two 7,500-litre water tanks in the ground. These will collect stormwater to irrigate the gardens and feed water features. There's nothing Bob hasn't thought about, and one of the main reasons he's bought this plot is for the views. We're going to be taking that, the rest of that timber wall out so that we can start measuring up for the two big glass doors that are going to go in. 
we're just going to cut those three studs, take them out, and then cut that last one, leave the head on, yep. um, take that out. Just hope it doesn't get the old brickwork that's been there for 100 years. Bob's million dollar home is finally getting the million dollar view it deserves. Righto, you ready? Game time. Ready? Go. Go. She's going, push it. <laughs> Done. Not bad view now. Very nice, very nice. Bob's vision for his new home is slowly taking shape. It's not the first time an ambitious renovation project of this scale that also fuses old with new has been done in Brisbane. Builder Glenn Williams and his wife Gabby bought, restored and extended this church, which was derelict, four years ago, and the results are spectacular. They wanted to renovate the historic church, but build an ultra-modern wing for them to live in as well. Outside, they've also built a pool and tennis court in the magnificent grounds. The new building is very much a juxtaposition to the old one, and we didn't, you know, on purpose, didn't try and compete with the church. So I think that the two buildings play off nicely against each other. This is a style of architecture that I love anyway. Concrete and timber, very much like an industrial style. That's what I had in my mind for this house. My architect, he was very much on board with that thought pattern. I said, I want the pool out here. Bedrooms up top, I want big open spaces just laid it out and then he started, he come back with his first draft and it was really good. We never changed from it, never, it, the, the look and everything, he nailed it. The styling was tricky because they are such separate spaces uh, in different themes. So we have kept the interior of the new house clean and, and simple and um, earthy tones. Whereas the church with the beautiful stained glass windows, we wanted lush fabrics, something cosy, something really warm. And we wanted to be true to the space. And it, it's okay that it was very separate to the rest of the house. It is a big space to fill, so we had to think long and hard about how to furnish it. Um, in the end, we couldn't find a dining table large enough, so Glenn got his tools out and built the table, so this is custom made. We could have a lot of fun with this, all the colours from the stained glass windows. We could do crazy chairs, we could do Chesterfield lounges. It's almost very gentleman's lounge, kind of. With the big dining tables, we sort of thought it would be like a scene from The Last Supper, you know, inside the church. Glenn and Gabby have really stretched their imaginations here, fusing old and new. I love this part of the house. From here I can see the pool, the view, the children playing, the front yard, out to the church, tennis court. It's why we bought the, the property. Glenn and Gabby have created a striking home while importantly, preserving the historic church within it. I think for the most part, people love it. We always have people stopping out the front and taking photos and stuff. And it's sort of funny when people are at the front taking a photo and you pull up, they sort of hide their camera and, <laughs> and chuff off. The children's friends love to come and visit. There's plenty for them to do with the tennis court, the pool. So we're lucky in that regard. And, um, and also to position wise, so we're close to town. To sell up and move somewhere, I just can't imagine where we would go that would 
give us this much, give the family this much. Jeez, they might bury us in the old graveyard. You never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> it sure would be hard for anyone to give up such an incredible home. With the outer shell of Bob's grand restoration project now almost complete, he's pushing for innovative design throughout the inside. He's particularly excited about the floating bedroom. The architect's um, intention for the loft bedroom was to make it look like it uh, was hovering in the middle of the space and it has the views right throughout the whole site, right throughout to the city. The floating bedroom is an engineering magic trick. The support beams are hidden in the kitchen ceiling. Bob is using Australian hardwood to trim the beams and visually connect them to the timber screens either side. At the top, hidden fixings secure the bedroom to the ceiling to brace it in position. For Bob, keeping the historic hall centre stage in this build has always been a priority. He's even incorporating original features from the hall into the new extensions. These cathedral windows will form the framework for shelves to hold and display bottles as part of a striking wine cellar. This house will be the ultimate in complementing the old with the new. This pool will be solar heated. There'll be a waterfall set up in that corner, which, uh, which will just independently flow down um, over the rocks into the pool. Bob wants water to be a major feature in the house, so he's also commissioned a waterfall for the upstairs lounge. It's being made out of special glass off-site by Lisa de Boer at her studio on the Gold Coast, south of Brisbane. Lisa's been making art installations out of glass for 27 years. It's a, such a durable product, like it can go outside. I can do art on outside walls and on the outsides of buildings and I know it's going to look like that forever. Lisa will melt a large sheet of glass into a sand mould in this kiln to give the waterfall an unusual finish. The first stage is to scrape the sand, so it has to be perfectly level. I don't want any undulations or anything that can change the form of the glass because whatever this is, the beginning is how it's going to end up. The next stage is to start pressing the rocks in. Lisa's made these rock effect rollers to create imprints in the sand. They will help carry the rock theme from the walls into the waterfall. This car mat. I actually saw on the side of the road and thought, wow, that'd make such a cool rock mould. So when it's pressed in, it's going to make a dint in the sand, which creates that whole rock texture. So I'm just sort of putting it little bits and pieces here and there, not too evenly spaced, because I want it to look a little bit, bit arty-farty. <laughs> cool. Now the soccer ball. These textures with the, with the soccer ball I'm making now, is where I'm going to add little bits of silver leaf to the piece. So see how they just give it a little bit of a variance going down? Just get my little trusty feather. I think that's it. Ta-da! <laughs> That'll look cool. Everything that's in there at the moment, the glass will form around it, so it will melt. It gets to liquid toffee at 800, and it just starts melting down into that design. They carefully position the glass sheet in the kiln on top of the layer of textured sand. OK, boys, you ready? <laughs> that's the top of the glass there. So, yeah, it will sit, say, 80 mil from the bottom. Yeah. So, yeah, come this way a little bit more. Yep. Yep. Yes, there. Beautiful. Lisa then slowly heats the kiln to 800 degrees Celsius. We'll put it on and ready to go. This is now on for the next two to three days. And because the weather's so hot, it takes a bit longer to cool down. And you've got to cool it naturally, because otherwise the glass will crack. Two weeks later, and the glass waterfall is ready to install. The main feature of today is the uh, direction of the in interior waterfall. It's a combination of a, a big aluminium tray and uh, a slump glass piece that's over three metres long and nearly a metre wide. 
I haven't seen the finished product, so it's going to be interesting. The glass will sit inside a tray to contain the water and stop it spilling out onto the hall floor. Lisa is on site with her team to help secure the piece into position. Wow, yes. very nice. A few, few silver leaf highlights, yep. and when you light it up from the front, yep. they'll all be a little bit sparkly. They will, I'll pick it up. Yeah. yeah, great. The glass panel has been toughened to make it as strong as a car windscreen. Even so, they must handle this three metre monster extremely carefully. Because this is toughened glass now, it becomes five times stronger than normal glass. As long as they don't drop it on its edge like that or hit it on its edge and then it will explode. Sorry, no pressure. That's good. The boys are just putting a big bead of silicon in and it's all antifungal silicon so it doesn't go mouldy. It's going to look fantastic. I um, can't wait to get the lights on it. Yeah. Capture the water coming down, and I think it's going to be a perfect and blend think, with the rocks. Yeah. I like it. Once finished, the waterfall will be a striking feature in the lounge. It's now just over two years since Bob embarked on what he planned would be a two year build to renovate his historic hall. Site manager Tim and his team are pushing ahead to make up time. But Bob is changing the plans to make the old hall even larger, which is slowing them down. Through the back, we've got a living room that's getting extended out, which is an add-on. We've decided to do that late, um, just to give us some more living space upstairs. And we've also got a, another deck going out to the side of it, which I think is going to house an outdoor fireplace. Probably eight weeks in the making of this part of it. There's a lot of engineering goes into something like this. Bob's original plan was to remove the stage in the old hall and build a lounge in its place. But this wouldn't have been big enough for the whole family. So Bob has decided to extend the lounge with an extension and a 20 square metre steel and timber deck. This will give him plenty of space and panoramic city views to boot. Keen to get the build back on track, Bob, who has now recovered from his broken leg, is on site to lend a hand. Hang on, want, want to go a little bit higher, Bob? 520 from the inside of the beam, that brings it about 25 mil out from the stone, stone wall. Yep, and that governs everything coming this way. Yeah. Perfect. They sit on top. Yeah. Yep. And our floor joists sit in between, 20 mil below, so our decking runs same as the outside deck runs into the sides of the steel. Hi. The Look boss, out. Yeah. please. My second conscience. <laughs> <laughs> Come up and show me the glass. Bob's daughter, Lucy. Oh, it's looking so good. All right, yeah. show me the plan. So... ..is also on site today to help him select the coloured panes of glass that will sit in the rear wall. The glasswork will create a stunning feature that pays tribute to the heritage of the hall. OK, so blue, blue, yellow, yellow, purple. Yep. And then white, white round there. Yeah. That clear glass just gives us a nice, good, clear view of the western part of the city and, and Mount Kutha, yeah. you know? Yeah, which is so much nicer. I'd much prefer mountain view than mm. looking at all exactly. the Exactly, yeah. Oh, it's like a puzzle. It is indeed, okay. it is indeed. It takes Tim and the team several weeks to erect the steel framework for the extended lounge deck and terrace, which will both have great views of the city. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. So good to get all that up today. I'm thinking something's always going to go wrong with this, but everything went up today perfect for a change. With the framework for the rear window now complete, the glaziers can begin to install the glass. These custom jobs, every cut has to be millimetre perfect, and yeah, it's just trial and error. 
see how we go. A lot of dust. 110 year old dust. <laughs> Bob has commissioned 20 bespoke windows to adorn both the outside and the inside walls. One will create a feature in the walls of his wine cellar. We've got all these extra cables in that Bob ordered here. So there's a feature light in this front one here and a feature in there which will turn on. And then all the others will turn on on two separate switches. So there's like wine bottles and grapes and stuff in the two feature ones. Yeah. And then the other ones are just coloured glass. Another window, made from stained glass, features the hall as it looked when originally built in 1912. Oh, this looks nice. Good, doesn't it? Yeah, boys did a good job of that. Yeah. yeah. The white really brings it out. Doesn't it? Yeah, I reckon so too. Oh, that's really yeah. cute. No? No. Take the front. Unless you put the screws in the wrong side. Even fits. How about that? So this is the actual what it was supposed to look like back in the day? Yeah, right. Beautiful. It's now 33 months since Bob embarked on his ambitious scheme to move, extend and transform the historic Salvation Army Hall. Even though it's taken nearly a year longer than planned, all the hard work is finally paying off. Outside, the pavilions now connect to the main hall. And the planted rock gardens are taking shape. Inside, the new hand-built kitchen is being delivered. A large island will take centre stage. Still on the island bench, floating island bench, so it's open all the way through. And then we've got all the joinery to fit inside of it. For Bob, it's all about creating a magnificent kitchen for his whole family to enjoy. So this should be able to get lifted yeah, up. and they want a minimum of 350. Bob's daughter Lucy and his son Jack have come to check on progress. I love these. Such yeah. a good job, honestly. Yeah. It's the first time they've seen the inside coming to life. You remember I said to you I'm going to do steel on the benches. Oh, steel. OK, well, yeah. Yeah, so... And then it's coming out as a breakfast bar? Yeah, that's the steel that I'm going to be buffing and then putting a clear cut on. It looks like a burnished black. That will look so yeah. good. And then the fish tank will sit central. And is the fish tank in the kitchen for easy seafood access? <laughs> Bob is keeping little reminders of the building's past wherever he can. That's all the, the painting that was on the stage. So that'll just be um, cleaned up and then put a clear cut over it. Yeah, no, I really like that. Connection between the new and the old, you know. And he is extremely proud of what will be the wine cellar. Do you think it's big enough? I, I think so. <laughs> Bob's new home is finally emerging out of the old hall. At every stage, he's making bold decisions and commissioning bespoke designs. Two months later, Bob's back on site, and it's a big day for him his builder, Tim, and the team. So I've made note to really get in these cracks and seal them already. In the wine cellar, the team has laid the base of the floor. It's made from basalt stones, which are hard wearing, but need to be sealed. And that's all block, and then it's also sitting on a block about that big. OK. Jacob and the team now need to pour a translucent epoxy resin over the stonework. This will set smooth and solid on top and look like glass. We're installing a 40 mil thick glass floor over the stone with a one mil clear over the top. Casting resin we need for the body. Yeah, right. To level out, go glass, and yep. then we've got that final coat just to seal it all off. So I think we've got roughly around 200 litres to put it To in go there. in. Yeah. Yeah, OK. What's that worth? About $10,000 sitting out there. In, in, that, in those drums. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> It's a time-consuming process. The liquid has to be handled with care and mistakes will be costly. So that bubble isn't an issue. The mixture is made up of two parts of resin and one part catalyst, which speeds up the drying process. This is super slow mixing. You cannot aerate it. Mixing too quickly will cause the resin to heat up and create bubbles, 
so they need to get it just right. $10,000 worth of product going on the floor. Or in the next, next layer. I just seem to try and push it in these corners. Go in. It's a delicate process. They need to pour the resin slowly and evenly to fill all the gaps and set level. Pour in the next, next layer. It also calls for fancy footwork, moving out of the room as they go to avoid putting their feet in it. It's just going to level out, yeah. One 30-litre bucket down, another nine to go. Outside, Tim and the team are fitting metal awnings, custom-made at Bob's workshop, over the top of the windows to provide shade. Some of the largest will sit over the lounge windows. We did those measurements together at the time, so I wonder what's different about it, what's changed? But there's a problem. Might have um, missed a measurement somewhere. Even for the most experienced fabricators like Bob, mistakes can happen. He's not taken into account the additional 50 millimetres needed on each side to cover the mounts. It's hard when you're doing one-off items to get them right. Like, it's this job has one-off items everywhere. After some head scratching, they devise a solution. We've got a batten along there and a batten along there. Yeah, yep. OK. It evolves as you, as you run it through your head and, and look, at, look at a problem. Um, quite often, you can e evolve a new way of doing it. Once you get onto the red roofing iron, it's all right. They'll remove the mounts and attach the awnings directly to the metal frame of the building, hanging them slightly higher than originally planned. We've got plenty of room to drill through that flat bit of steel. I'll just drill through that straight through with a... and then get those... Bat put batten screws into that. Just grab that ladder in the middle there. You've got half of the bottom you line in... You got that there for a second. Now. I just got to move over to. So is that what you had in mind? Yep. Hold yours there, Neil. And then we just do a hidey, little hidey trim all the way around it. Yeah. Go and tell him he's not that intelligent. <laughs> that does look really good, and I do like the height of it anyway. To be honest. Oh, the height's better. Inside, aquarium expert Brendan is making Bob's first house guests feel at home. These are babies, you know, African cichlids. Plenty of room in here for them. Bob's commissioned this 900-litre fish tank as the focal feature in the entry hall. All right, guys, time to go into your new home. I had fish tanks just when I was a kid, but that's 40, 50 years ago. I'd say they're going to be a little bit funny for a few hours, but I think um, Get by tomorrow, yeah. they'll all be swimming around all nice and happy. They're the new residents in the house and the first residents in the house, so he's pretty happy about that. Are we going to lift this out or just...? I think we'll lift that middle one out now, yeah. Outside, around the garden... So we're just putting these blocks under here, Bob, because yep. that'll give us the exact height of... How hot we want to be. How we want to be off the post. Off the, off the base plate. Tim and his team are erecting Bob's custom-built fence. Let's go. The design of this fence was based on a natural raw feel about the stone. The fence is fabricated from weathering steel. Its rich orange tones blend with the stonework. OK. Right, mate. Go Let's grab go. that. The steel appears rusty, as it has an oxidised coating that actually protects it from erosion. But, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. There may be no need to paint, and it looks better with age, but it's tricky to assemble. We're working with steel, so it's so hard to get it plumb and straight, and, but I think we've excelled this morning. Bob's love for metalwork follows through to the inside, too. This is a finished bench. Yeah, That's how it's, it's going to look, but a little bit shinier. This 24-kilogram sheet of steel will top the kitchen island. So you ran it, you're in around a bit there, Jared. That's it. It does yeah. look spectacular, mate. Can you imagine like when it gets it a little bit glossier. I had my, I had my doubts. I'm like, oh, is it going to look good? But <laughs> so you can make one for me now. Yeah, all right. At yeah. home. Yeah. <laughs> Two months later, Bob's restoration of this 110-year-old Salvation Army hall into his dream four-bedroom luxury home is almost complete. 
It's taken a year longer than Bob intended and has cost more than he budgeted for. But the result is spectacular. The historic hall now forms the heart of Bob's incredible new futuristic looking dream home. It houses the main living space, including the kitchen, lounge, and master bedroom. Two large pavilions containing leisure space and additional bedrooms sit attached to the front and back to treble the building's footprint. A sweeping first floor front deck maximizes the spectacular city views. Outside, Bob's recycled many of the hall's original windows and timbers. On the roof, solar panels create a clean supply of energy. A lush garden is establishing itself around the home. The range of materials and colors from white painted timbers to warm basalt stonework give the interlocking buildings a striking look. Inside the hall, the vast feature windows flood the open plan layout with warm, natural light. I've not regretted anything. I think with the way I did it, it was done in a more dragged out fashion, but that was the way the design went. It's certainly been worth it. Um, I've learnt a lot along the way. Um, it's been a really evolutionary thing to do because a lot of it's been designed as we went. As I lost my wife before I started the project, I thought I'd better definitely go ahead and do it. I think you've also learnt that you probably don't want to do another one for a little while, right? <laughs> yes, that, let's just say that the, uh, I like to just sit and enjoy for a while. By extending the footprint of the build, Bob's added contemporary elements, but his focus has always been to keep the old hall centre stage. We've always liked older things and renovating something with a bit of spirit and a bit of vintage to it. That's just the way we've always been. And there was easy ways to do things, but I think you like to stay true to buildings as well. Do you still want things to look and feel original, not like you've just taken something old and put something new inside? Everything in it has been if it had to be replaced, it got replaced with the identical piece of equipment. So all the windows have been made to match what was there before. There was no stained glass, but there was a little bit of um, opaque decorative glass. All those front arch windows, and they've all been reproduced exactly how it was before. So I've kept the, this building true to its, yeah. to its design. When the guys from the Salvos came to check it out after you did stuff to it, they still had that connection to it. It looked different, obviously, but it, it still felt the same. There used to be a stage here that they used to use it for performances. Mm. We actually shifted all the timber from that and we put it into one of the ceilings downstairs, the painted ceiling that uh, was previously their painted wall for their stage. So we've tried to use all the elements. Upstairs is Bob's unusual design masterpiece, the floating bedroom. Some people might look at it and think, you know, there is some very quirky, eccentric elements. But again, that's our family. We've, we've never been normal. We've, we've never been beige. Our decisions are never tailored to, now what would everyone else do? Or what, what, what's the most popular thing to do right now? So I think this house speaks to that. Yeah, there are some quirky things, but... Uh, mm. uh... You're a quirky guy. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Bob removed the rear wall of the hall to open up the building so it could take in the magnificent Brisbane skyline. But he kept a link to the past by commissioning a stained glass window of the hall. That glass is so worth it, isn't it? It's so hey? good. Oh, the way it was um, come up. Yeah. The choices that we made. Lying bed here. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Laying in bed, yeah. waking up to this. Yeah. When can I move in? Mm, exactly. <laughs> The stained glass helps make this a colourful house. I love the stained glass. Yes. That's my favourite part yeah. of this place. Whilst we kept the front of the building to its original form, we've added a little bit of 
you couldn't say it's modern, but it's called the crazy glass or something. I forget now what it is. But, oh, uh, yeah, there's a name for it. Yes, there is, yeah. This was the last part that they did. And I remember it was called graffiti glass. Yes, That's graffiti right. glass. Yeah, exactly. It's just such a mix. It's an mm, eclectic yes, mix mm, of stuff. Exactly. Along with glass, metal and stone, water plays a big part in Bob's design features. From the 900-litre fish tank to the custom-moulded glass waterfall. But Bob's pride and joy is his wine cellar. Ah, oh, this I love. I told you I got those ideas from Greece. Mykonos, I think it was. This recycled stained glass window frame doubles up as a wine cabinet, and the basalt stone floor with glass-like epoxy resin is a triumph. Bob's been determined to have bespoke and innovative design throughout the house, but this has come at a price. I asked throughout the entire yeah. build. I said, do yeah, you did. know how much you've spent? About four times I asked. Yes. Renovation is always going to be more expensive than a new build. It's up around the two and a half mil mark. The fact that we went so far over the budget, I've never ever thought that it wasn't worth it. I've always felt that uh, it, de it deserved it. For Bob, this was always a passion project, to respect and retain the history and integrity of the old Salvation Army Hall. In every way, we've achieved this special home, I suppose. It's got all the old elements that we wanted to keep, and then it's got the attachment of the new elements with the, with the pavilions. It's a real blend of ideas and design and yet still keeps it true to the, to the age of the building. So it's been a very satisfying process. I often think about if it had been done any differently if Robin had been around. The only difference would have been, I think maybe the process would have been done a bit quicker. I think she would have loved this house, absolutely loved it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that she'd give it the tick. Mm. Irrespective of the time it's taken, Bob has built a completely unique home where he, his children and grandchildren can create future memories. It was worth it 110%. Yeah, loved every minute of it.